Well, you know, the, the, the referees and the assistant referees and the TMO and the bunker, like we're going crazy, haven't we, really? Um, all of that scrutiny said that was a red card offence. And they, they've got all the detail there, so I'm not to argue about that. I just feel, feel for the guy, you know. It's the first time that a, a red card has been issued in the World Cup final. There was no malice in it. It wasn't dirty play. Um, it's just unfortunate. And he's going to have to live with that for the rest of his life, which is very difficult. You know, he's the captain of the All Blacks. Any captain of, a, of a, any of the sides in the World Cup and those sort of things happen is very difficult. So I feel for him. I, I, I'm not criticising the, the, um, the decision. I'm not, I'm not concerned about the scrutiny. Um, it just takes a lot of time. And like we're competing for audience, we at rugby people are competing for audiences, and the game, because of all the scrutiny, uh, it's losing its flow. Um, and I think people, you could feel the tension in the stadium with all the stoppages, all the scrutiny and so on. So can we do that better? But I think we need to simplify the game. Simplify the game. Uh, so everybody understands the game. Now, that's a big job. But I would, for example, I'd drop the tackle height to waist level and below. And if they did that, it would open up the game. There wouldn't be so many breakdowns or tackle areas. Like, there must be 60, 70, 80 of those in a game. And, but if you had the tackle height as waist and below, you'd free the ball up, you'd have a much more attractive game, much more athletic game. Right now, it's it's a defence-dominated game. So defence dominates the attacks in most games. So we need more balance there. We need the attack to be able to exploit the defence more often and make it a more attractive game for the public. That, that, that would be very... Yeah, I think that's a positive. Mm. I'm just concerned it's five years before this promotion and relegation. So the, the 12 teams in the second group will be frustrated with World Rugby's decision not to have promotion and relegation from the start. So they're protecting the top 12. Mm -hmm. And the other teams need the incentive to, to go up and improve. They're not going to improve by just staying where they are. So I think that's a negative, personally, but I like the, the concept. I like the concept of those top 12 teams and the second 12 teams playing on a regular basis. No, Nuggets got better, you know, Aaron Smith got better. And I thought he played probably his best rugby in this tournament, mm -hmm. ever. And he was outstanding yesterday, I thought. Um, so he'll be very proud, but he'll be, oh, I keep on saying, he'll be disappointed because they didn't get the result. But there's always this cycle, you know, there's always the World Cup cycle and you'll get a half a dozen, maybe eight players who are going to retire from international rugby, maybe not play rugby again. A lot of them will go overseas and play professionally and and hopefully have a good financial base when they retire from the game. But they've been great servants. Like you mentioned Sam White, like, you know, he's, I'm not sure, is it 150, 152 test matches now? That's a, that's a record, is it? It's a New Zealand record anyway. I think it's a world record. Yeah, so, you know, he's been a great servant. Four World Cups, unbelievable. And there's a number of others. Um, and Sam Kane will be one, I would imagine, although I'd, he, he hadn't come out and said that. So there'll be half a dozen eight players who will retire from international rugby. But that's normal in a cycle, a World Cup cycle. Yeah, definitely, and I think a lot of them will, will go away with great praise. And well, yeah, I, like I've got no, no problem. Um, South Africa won the game. Um, they hugely motivated side you know I think they probably put more eggs in the World Cup basket than most teams do because their players are playing all around the world because financially they can't maintain them in South Africa you know so the economy and the RAND's not strong enough and they come together every four years and they have an extended period of time um, and they play for the nation it's, pow pass it's powerful uh, it's powerful what they that they do, and you no, know, everybody plays for their nation. But 
these guys are totally dedicated because the nation has some challenges and they're very emotional about that. Um, so I was on the sideline in 2019. I was a comments, comments man for a television company mm. and I just had so much respect when they won in 19 and their reaction afterwards, they're good men and they play, they play good rugby but they play for their nation. And then, as I say, their nation has got some challenges and they realise that and they're trying to, to get, get a good feel factor going there through their performance. And you've got to, you've got to respect that. And they just revere the man. Khaleesi is, is epitomises... Like, he was, he, lived up, he grew up in a shanty town. He could have gone the other way. He finished up the captain of the South Africans. He sees himself he could have finished up in jail. And so he, he is an inspiration. He is exactly epitomises what the whole team is trying to do, lift the nation. He's lifted himself. Uh, he's so emotional about the nation and, and what they can do to help. And the players just look up to him. And he's, he, he leads by example. He leads by his voice. Um, he doesn't put himself ahead of anybody else. So often he gets subbed, which is unusual for an international captain. So he, he thinks he's part of the team rather than you know, having grandiose ideas about his own ability. So he's, he's a marvellous role model for South African rugby.